Hello everyone, today we talk about the mendicant orders. This was the topic of one of my very early videos and you know it, it happens like this that choosing them randomly sometimes they 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 concentrate just in one 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 time, one phase, one year. You know, usually there are some topics that repeat themselves for this random fashion like that and they remain concentrated in a time rather than another. The mendicant orders uh, is one of those topics that um, require really a lot of you know ecclesiological knowledge in general. I you know you know I'm I'm, I'm a very modest polymologist. I don't um, I don't know much myself about these topics. Every time, however, I learn about the history of the church and uh, as it's necessary for a medievalist, but more than that, right? For for a, for every person in the world at this point, really without distinctions, which it seems to be, you know, instead quite the other way around, instead that nobody really cares or understand or maybe wants to understand why these things are important. In fact, you discover so much about the world you live in and uh, especially you, you start understanding properly the, the, the function, right, the purpose, uh, the reason why such um, orders in this case were created but let's say what the church was doing properly at the time why and what Im dramatically important consequences this had in, in a positive sense for in this case the West and so how it kind of you know catalyzed further you know growth and consolidation stability and the we will surely make a, a multitude of videos in the future if we go on, uh, you know, God allowing fact. Uh, it's the case to say um, uh, on this topic, I don't know when, but of course, uh, we will go in some detail to it because it's really a, a big topic. Let's say I may even create a playlist at this point. So we have already seen, I don't know, this may be the first time you listen to me, uh, other uh, followers, uh, you know, surely have gained more more understanding where where I, you know, where we come from with this, right, all the videos we made about the medieval church and, you know, its development, this, uh, this quite uh, crucial uh, regulation of politics and, and society uh, through, through its means. So, we when when we look at the thirteenth, you know that that's the 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 century of the of of, of the mendicant orders and and of much more of this the 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 the, the peak of medieval expansion um, and uh, wealth and you know and uh, and devil, let's say properly also of articulation of m different ways of lives and so on. Um, we're talking about a moment we often give it for granted that. Before which, properly, um, was still very primitive, right? The the history of the world is rarely conceived like this. But properly, you know, we we mostly segment uh, eras in, you know, yes, before there were kind of the, the Greeks, then the Romans, then there were kind of the medievals, and yes, there were some differences in between. But it's as if we didn't observe that this was actually the same world, and that in the, you know, it doesn't matter where you know there was a rise and fall of certain certain civilizations so on still the world was growing in the meanwhile right certain ideas could not be really you know erased or certain you know evidence or infrastructures couldn't really be just you know couldn't just disappear wouldn't just disappear there was a, a building over with a continuous growth a continuous expansion and so the 13th century is really the moment of which also properly wealth uh, starts arriving en masse, right, or at least consolidates. It was true, you know, from, from from some century in a way, but let's say properly passing from natural to to monetary economy, for example, um, in ob obviously in, in an appreciable de degree, right? Not that the, the the former would would disappear at all, but let's say properly also the development, the revival of of of, of the cities, as we have seen. And as we know, in general, the mendicant orders were created to essentially counter the spread of heresy exactly in those centers that were incidentally the centers of a new lay culture, right? So also something that 
before this time we had never quite seen right but more in general um, you know properly a different way in fact of approaching uh, the scriptures the world and, and so uh, really a new way of, of looking at existence in a sense so up to that point and this is important also to understand the reformistic instances of the church the church in fact had never favored the direct reading of the scriptures from the side of the faithful right and there is a reason right they weren't this is the idea of the, the oppression the terrible obscurantism of the middle age what would have been the point of you know favoring uh, something that nobody could have in the first place basically done or even had the interest of doing right how could have this been possible considering the the scarce uh, you know uh, you know uh, literacy and the same spread of, of of written works right in, in general in in the community not that these didn't exist or you know that there weren't uh, highly educated people or that and the world had forgotten manuscripts up to that point that's yet another cliche but at large right as in basically all pre-industrial societies let's say alphabetization is is largely useless for the majority of people because these have to mostly uh, leave in fact in conditions that have to, to make them survive literally in terms of you know um, agricultural surplus whatever and you know that's not something that you just teach by you know teaching these people to read especially considering that the world world kind of functions like this so we have not yet arrived to a point where you know that, that, that there are the forces to enact properly as a surplus in the, the world community right because th this is what the surplus that maintained the world community including the church feudalism and so on uh, there was no way properly to deliver uh, coercively authoritatively like kind of a compact uh, say pack of of education would make people you know discovering you know own modern science or physics etc it was still a word that didn't legitimately first of all know almost anything about but simply you know didn't have you know had much more important and vital and concrete things to think about um, and you know how many videos we made about literacy even in the early in the high middle ages and uh, later on of course so to stress also how of course there were people who were educated and that was a dramatic uh, achievement that this shows actually how intellectually active this wars had been right even in what we think as to as, as the, the dark ages and all this garbage but um properly yes the, there was a uh, everything was coherent with the, with the world of the time um, and so, as we will see now, also the spread of education that the mendicant orders would have championed at basically uh, the same, the highest levels of education at the time, that's how they would actually become, is to be understood in, as in many things, civilizationally, in conflict, right, in, you know, in new needs that had emerged to, say, not to make literacy spread, but actually, you know, countering at least the um the the ideas that the, the wrong doings that were behind uh the, the the extremism of the most radical uh, uh church uh, reformistic ideas that were often in fact the uh the um, let's say in the face of something beyond which much else actually stood in terms of interest and so on and that brought to the need of spreading education also among uh, spreading literacy and you know awareness also about one's own religion it's yet another important point among the masses right for what it was possible of course at the time so we're talking about the masses and not in a mass society sense but still those that were now uh, willing and because of their acquired wealth and so on to 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 even educate themselves right so Definitely a world where, uh, you know, much autonomy was surely showing aside, you know, next just to the most structured powers that still worked thanks to such things. So the the same priests historically from centuries um, that would have had to explain to the faithful the, the world of God 
were too often ignorant and in irreparably so, right? That, that by the 13th century, there had been a big deal of, you know, also standardization of um, ecclesiastical education. Uh, this had started consistently in what we think, in fact, is Western Europe in this post-Carolingian boundary since, uh, in fact, the, uh, the Carolingian reforms that needed some degree of uniformity in administration. Before that, the, the clergy was, I mean, they didn't even know how to read Latin, right? We have very, very interesting, you know, and objectively funny um, accounts from places like, I don't know, still uh, the boundaries of, of also the same, you know, the frontier of St. Christianity where literally it was not just not understanding the bible at that point trying to to understand it without you know without understanding the actual words and this from the clergy not from the ignorant right not from the peasants let's say so <coughs> you can't imagine what the situation had been here we don't digress on how by the 13th century still in especially many areas of europe does how concrete this would still be but let's say that um the in general, the chances for catechesis were scarce, right? Um, there was, they were limited essentially to the homily that accompanied the mass and that many priests were not even capable of holding fundamentally. And the monastic orders by themselves could not have solved to the necessities of the new times because, first of all, monasteries up to that point had not usually at least been in the cities that is so to, to direct contact with those uh, direct prolonged contact with, with the masses right um, the monasteries were in contact with the rest of the world weren't isolated like uh, a hermit would be right they they had on the contrary behind monasticism was a very precise purpose of actually being known by by the second by, by the rest of the world um, and in general the monks however were didn't were probably were not trained were not they were not educated themselves to teach the people nor administratively they didn't have the cura animarum that is properly the pastoral mansions among their duties uh, differently from the secular clergy that at least you know thinking about the bishops the archbishops and so on uh, uh, that lived in the cities but had had in fact a uh, and as a consequence, also had a very different type of, of education. That that is the same one from which actually the same lay culture that we find, especially from you know pouring out um, very consistently from from the 11th century onwards, even earlier, um, in the cities, right? So in the most urbanized areas of Europe, were all about that administration, the base of lay culture. In fact, in, in sense of eventually secular governments, the same ones that would recover Roman law, it said would create the same issues of the investiture controversy and so on. But because the same clergy were educated in, in those topics as well. And um, and part of the reason you can argue why, you know, literacy had spread in the cities was, was also that one among the others, right? And the fact that cities were simply the, the most active centers where people were simply more more exposed to the complexity of the world. They needed tools to, to, to cope with that, to frame it in some functional, profitable. Um, on the other hand, uh, the many good Christians that wanted to live according to the spirit of the gospel without entering the clergy or if their faith um, was particularly troubled let's say to to the era to, to an heretical movement began in the city proper to be wanted to experimentate in in uh, to experiment in spontaneous groups uh with a marked penitential character the lifestyle um, suggested by the gospel itself and the acts of the apostles. So this was a, um, a, a communal existence, right? They, it was, um, in, in theory, like the void of hierarchy, right? It was based on the communion of, of goods. And in 1173, we made a video about this, the Leonese merchant Peter Walter founded on such 
spaces, the community of the pauperes lugdunenses, so the, the poor of Lyon, um, essentially committing himself to the spread of his ideal with, through preaching. And uh, there were th he was not the only one doing this. There were many controversies. The main things also, for example, also women were allowed in, in preaching. Church was disagreed. You know, he uh, he was uh, Waldo was eventually condemned as an heretic. As also, first of all, only the clergy could preach, right? And speaking of uh, pre you know life in prayer and poverty. Uh, who would have mm, would have wanted to follow it could have accessed in theory to to any monastic order it wasn't even a particularly different difficult thing to do um especially at that time if you look at the spread of the Cistercians, of you know you know there had been a process of also uh you know of, of literally of, of expansion but it was easier than than before or at least than, than had been mostly in the, uh, the peak of, you know, aristocratic, uh, for example, with the colonial reform, but it, it, it had never been really a, a huge problem, even the same education, right, for especially in the early Middle Ages, whoever really had the the desire of doing that, that again, most wouldn't even see the, the point of, because it would have been, you know, counterproductive, could actually access the educational structures that the church offered, and so it wasn't uh, like and yet, so these move behind these movements. There were other motivations in general that were also pretty, you know, content. Say they had a, uh, in fact, a kind of a, a positional uh, attitude that towards the, the the church. They 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 were they, they wanted to create a, a different example lifestyle. You know and properly worldview in compared to to the church and Waldo's example was however followed especially in Lombardy in Tuscany where as we have seen the the memory of the Pateria um, was, uh, was still alive right so this instance again it was essentially a pauperistic movement it was condemning the uh, mostly the acts of simony of the clergy and so on and and from these uh, movements, uh, some penitential uh, societies were born, such as the 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 poor of Lombardy that lived um, in common, and in common they also put the fruits of their of their labor, and the humiliated. We made a video about them. Uh, if you search for it, too, a movement that was born among the. Um, the essentially the proletarians, uh, the works of of of, uh, of the wool, right, of the textile um, industries in the great cities that um, later on um, would have at least in part been regained by by orthodoxy in the longer run. Well, Pope Innocent the Third, that we made a video just recently about, um, while coping with this. You know, spontaneous groups, right? He was very, uh, you know, uh, distrustful, right? You would know that Innocent was the the most powerful of all popes, I historically speaking, in terms of the, the, the peak of Roman Catholic uh, influence and and uh, you know, and reach and capacity and so on. So uh, his ideas were based mostly on the preeminence of, of the of the ecclesiastical hierarchy over over the seculum. It was the the moment of greatest temporal power of the church, and so these movements were unavoidably critical. And as we know, th at that point, um, Christianity, Western Christianity, and not only actually, this was also in the East, as we've seen with the Bogomils and so on, uh, was struggling against heresy. Right, the 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 Cathars, the, these movements that were were very often also mix at the point you blended in uh, in ways you couldn't really distinguish them there was not no real um homogeneity between uh, i mean within the the same uh, the same heretical groups was was difficult in a sense to target them because it would have been to target the ideas and that was fundamentally uh, impossible until these people didn't start do some doing something more 
or you know markedly identifiable in the creation of literally of other churches and with their own hierarchy and with their own with their own you know the support of certain political powers and so on it was a very harsh struggle so all these movements that were emerging by themselves were not uh, you know necessarily radical right all these groups more or less believed in the in, in, let's say at least in the unity of Christendom, they weren't seeing this mostly in a schismatic sense, right? They weren't saying um, the Church of Rome, for example, shouldn't exist most of the time. It's like, you know, they, they didn't have any. Uh, it, 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 the, 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 the problem was on the basis of which they interpreted the scriptures and the lack of regulation that existed. In this. So it was a huge problem because, again, uh, nobody up to that point had managed to control the the educational stru structures, the the spiritual fitness, and the uh, the overall uh, orthodoxy of you know the, the whole Christian world, at least the whole Western Christendom in this case. So, uh, the, literally, there weren't the tools. The tools had to be built. Somebody had to, to make the work. And all these masses that were kind of borderline orthodox, and they were from one side, you know, pushed by the same example of the, the most extremistic fringes that uh, in that sense also posed some problems the same the same Baldensians for example as we were saying were actually quite supportive of the you know the extermination of the catters about at the end of, of the, the Roman church just to, to, to make one example so um, the, this uh, never think by any stretch of the imagination that you know these heretics and heterodox movements were champions of free thinking in an enlightened m modernistic sense these people were as radically intolerant as you know tolerance didn't quite exist historically up to the uh, the, the the second half of the 17th century western europe uh, they were absolutely you know they wouldn't accept any other version they had their own same means of repression uh, they were often violent so there was probably nothing here like you know the the terrible uh, the hierarchies that want to to crush the evil poor martyrs of the champions of faith and free will there was no such thing like free will at the time right because the same religion rightly prohibits you from it right Relig religion offers liberty not freedom right it, it's something extremely different there is no value uh in a in an unregulated system civilizationally speak of any sort uh just still our own work is founded on this right you know who does decide that you can vote when uh, you know or where, where you can drive a car right it, it's always regulated absolute freedom would equate to the to the immediate extinction of all the human species right and and we're properly biologically not and genetically not not set for that right so it's, it's lunacy but aside from that in this sense don't think that this um, ecclesiological debate big you know big top you know, big 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 uh, definition for for what was actually happening with this heretical movements but let's say it was was taking place however within the idea of you know a world that would have had to escape towards who knows what still people were dramatically informed into that christian mindset they they they, they were actually just uh, founding their own beliefs on the radicalization of very specific instances right and the way of reading the gospels who could preach where what which this was written so um, uh, orthodoxy at that point had was also well established and it, re it had always existed because even at least it supported the healthy development of political and social structures but um, again uh, this new when these were ex for expanding Right in an unprecedented way, like by the, the 12th or the 13th century. Right, the, the the question was, you know, uh, are these things going to create something now new that can parallel, right, another you know another order can bring a fracture, right? And so, you know, that essentially the the Reformation was 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 the same thing, and you know, even there, however, it happened within still a much more mediated. Um, sister, there, there, were, there are similarities regarding to that, but let's say, st still, that is a good example because it shows you that still with existed within the um, the, the the organization of a the pregress organization of a church with all its structures, its hierarchies, and so it wasn't something merely you know, let's be free of anything in that regard.
And what, in fact, mostly concerns any civilization or reality is that, that these movements were autonomous from the ecclesiastical hierarchy. So literally there was no way of controlling them. There was no way of, you know, examining their, their, their orthodoxy to, you know, to make them respond. Sometimes they literally broke free of even the secular authorities. They, they were, you know, uh, there they were massacres, there were wars. They very often even mercenary bands joined them at some level. Talking about also pretty bloody events that, you know, were at, th at that point disrupting and spreading fear among the populations. Think about the Brabanson, the Cotero, all, all these, um, you know, the, the 12th century, we think that this is, you know, pre-humanism, this age of, you know, uh, reacquired confidence of humanity and a positive view of God. But it was actually a, a terrifying century, right? And it was full of wars and, you know, uh, also illnesses were spreading uh, faster than before in a more complex and populated society. It was, and, and that's why such agitations took sometimes also such violent, violent turns. Um, and so just even, even, simply heterodox movements or maybe orthodox movements that would escape ecclesiastical hierarchy just by this, this kind of attitude were in turn more exposed to heresy, right? They would kind of lean towards it by default at that point, but still they were also more easily prey of, of this other, you know, movement, m much more sectarianly organized movement like Catarism and so on that were r really wanted to create a parallel system to, to the one of Rome, copying it literally, you know, mirroring almost perfectly in the wrong way. Um, and in fact, even though such movements were kind of, you know, in part actually leaving uh, a correct Christian lifestyle, let's say the their sanctity, at least, you know, what they believe it was is of, of life, didn't exclude that they would mature instances of, of very strong criticism towards the same hierarchies. And so actually increasing the, the problem further. But in 1210, uh, Innocent III approved instead the initiative of a citizen of uh, Assisi in Umbria, in central Italy. Uh, this was the almost um, 30 years old uh, Francesco di Pietro Bernardone, right? So what we were talking about, Francis, St. Francis. Um, that was essentially son of a very rich merchant. He, he has many of these movements. We, we understand that. Uh, why you wonder even they were born in the cities. It, it's because of this, um, you know, lack of purpose brought by, you know, the apparent satisfaction of all the material desires. His father was dramatically rich. Um, these were communities were st starting to make really the big money that nobody, uh, this, is, this is the important thing, that nobody before had ever seen, right? So, all a political and social asset was unhinged together with the moral dimension of it. Notoriously, we'll talk about St. Francis in another video, hopefully soon, but, you know, he um, fundamentally refused, as you know, all, all his father's goods, and it was which ac actually a very serious thing, because, um, you know, that all the inheritance, these were military families. St. Francis was, was a knight, he fought, uh, it was, you know, a very luxury lifestyle, you know, the, the typically mobster, you know, violent lifestyle typical of the militas of, of the 13th century, right? And so he, ref he rejected all this, right? He, he um, uh, rejected the secular in this regard and together with some uh, companions, he dedicated himself to what was called properly a, a rule of life that prescribed absolute poverty, manual labor, uh, the mendicant, right? So itinerant uh, wandering lifestyle, and preaching practiced um, more with example than with work, right? So surely there was some influence there from the Benedictine example, you know, or at labor, all these things, and so. And um, this is really important, I mean, that a, that a pope would, um, I mean, there is some mythology behind the, the encounter because eventually the Franciscans and as well as the Dominicans as we'll see now were had been let's say created in a, in a more mediated way but let's say this great figure the, mo the, the most powerful pope in history like that decided was absolutely in favor of hierarchies and so on that decides to 
to make this important um, turn in the church and de deciding to open to the heterodox movements to essentially bring them back into orthodox and so allowing them to leave their lifestyle but still you know at that point integrating it in, 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 in the church and so making them you know leave within the same the same ecclesiastical hierarchy but you know with their their chosen lifestyle and with the adequate uh, control in their orthodoxy is a turning point in the history of western civilization because um the, the papacy and and his most um monarchic representatives uh, understood that there was no way at that point to stop um these uh lifestyle choices right and so it would have they, they weren't really doing in, in 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 many cases many harm any harm practically on the contrary they they were also assisting they were also kind of in, in their organization they were helping the poor they were you know controlling them there was uh, as we'll see now also an important issue on how they, they wouldn't have to regulate themselves because you know in, in theory the, in the most extremistic instances they refused property and therefore any form of internal organization but that's of course uh, a utopia um, and and in fact it ended the way we, we know and we will see um, but um, uh, still they you know th this opened dramatically um, the church to the to the sympathy of all these movements that realized that they could mm, blossom within the same protection of the church that again in most cases would the Roma of the Roman Church w was never criticized right during uh, say nobody during the Reformation had said you know the popes the popes from Rome have no business there nobody 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 would even like think something like that because it, it was obvious like it, that there were certain um, meanings at that point we have also completely lost as modern people regarding what it meant properly in terms of spiritual power what even properly the seat of Rome symbolically metaphysically uh, would would represent so it was kind of obvious that, that the issue was reforming the church not creating another one that's why the catters were so vicious instead because they they were actually you know uh, that was never fully rationalized or you know scientifically planned in a in a big scale way and it would have been impossible and that's also why in, even in that case things ended the way they did but they were concretely thinking it in you know and in at least their sects were, were operating in something that was willingly outside of it right? it would, that wasn't heterodoxy it was literally a, a dualistic heretical sect which had barely anything to do with Christianity so um, for Innocent the third Francis was the ideal devotee right because um, Francis life was absolutely poor and pure right but at the same time he um, took as a constant point of reference the church right in order to receive from it a direction a teaching right so he was the perfect type of the layman decided um, convinced to live saintly but obedient to Yerk so this was perfection right this meant that there was a model in Francis movement to be uh, to leave like this most radical instances but at the same time remaining perfectly obedient to, to the church and seeing it you know, of course as its point of reference its authority its unavoidable uh, spring right of, 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 uh, of, of sanctity guide and spiritual reference right um, and Francis didn't want to found an order either right from his side innocent was as we've seen kind of distrustful towards these new foundations at least the ones that would you know uh, assume this you know more um, you know radical direction um, and he thus approved mm, by voice right but without committing himself with any written document the um, life form of the group of Assisi and he 
had, uh, you know, con con granted to Francis the tonsure, that is to say, the haircut, a uh, haircut of a certain type that lived uh, bald the top of the head, and that was the exterior sign of the uh, belonging of uh, somebody to the clergy, right? And so authorized him to preach. Mm -hmm. This was an important symbol. And thus, uh, the Franciscan um, experience was inserted within the disciplinary frame of the ecclesiastical uh, hierarchy. So they said, yes, you, like, this is not an order, but I allow you, and I don't even commit myself to create one, right? You don't want that, I don't need that, but I, I like what you're doing. And I grant you the faculty of preaching, right? So you, you are in this, you know, state where you 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 receive essentially as, as a clerk, as part of the clergy, the the the, the, the authority to to preach. Um, this is interesting, also, considering that Innocent was a man of radically, you know, developed, you know, level of education at the time was really, you know, the, the embodiment of of the top of of moral and scientific capacity of the church. So it was also kind of interesting that, you know, I mean, Francis wasn't uh, a particularly educated person, so, but, um, as it was normal by, by that kind of background, but let's say it was the example brought by lifestyle that impressed probably innocent. So that that's why also the mythology, because there wasn't, like, about this meeting, there is, like, we think it, it actually happened, but there is no real, like, the, there is mostly the, the tradition, the Franciscan tradition pointing this out. We don't know that much about Francis' life either. We will see this in in, in, con, um, in, a, in another video, but it, it's remarkable still, because aside from the fact that we often underestimate properly the, the oral dimension this time, right, yes, we started having lots of written sources more uh, by the 13th century, on, but Still, the majority, of course, of um, I mean, interaction was was I mean, like today, but still more at the time in in, in the formal right uh, decisions connected to orality, right? So what the Pope would say equated in many ways to something public, right? And so it was like the, the big uh, you know the the, the, the declarations uh, in front of witnesses was a way to also for the the top secular authority for emperors for for kings to to affirm that you know that was law right and so you understand also how primitive the world worked uh, by the time but it's still remarkable in, in the episode however that to, to see how innocent would would be impressed by francis and how this um reflects still the you know the goodwill right not just the political intelligence of course and the interest that that the Pope had towards this experience and the possibility of kind of controlling it, but properly how he how much trust and uh, and and re you know and responsibility and um, and uh, and duty uh, gave gave Francis because even if he thought that there was uh, some real good in that lifestyle now. Francis of Assisi had also inspired the foundation of a group of penitent women. At the head of whom was the young, um, a noble woman, Chiara Schiffi, uh, who was from Assisi herself, just like Francis. So you, you understand here also the nobility. Th this is something that, you know, these were, again, as I was saying, uh, families of milites of these were the urban knights of communal italy you find even in occitania and southern france right much of the uh as would happen also in the in early christianity among the senator families right you know the senatorial families this this greater tension sometimes or for maybe it's it's like today we see in the world uh, all these new, you know, tensions, uh, you know, sometimes connected, or mostly connected to this lack of purpose and so on, that they don't strike actually the m much poor people in, in that sense. They strike actually, you know, the upper middle class. I mean, people were, who have money, who have education, who were not just, you know, particularly desperate, but they, they, they seem to be more, 
disoriented sometimes than others, um, or at least lacking purpose. So um, this connected uh, Saint Francis Saint Clair experience and one of their followers uh, to in this sense also to the origins of Christianity, to the idea of I mean, Jesus is pretty clear about this, that he had came with a sword to separate uh, fathers from sons, to, to create a, actually a lot of issues, and these were evidently some of them that would happen uh, all the time. Because, again, it was extremely important to, like, it was, um, it was extremely important to maintain in these um, military clans the, properly, the, the control on, on the various uh, inheritance, on the inheritance of who would have to succeed, and so these noblemen were involved in the major political, military, and social events of their communities. So it was, you know, these people were also loaded with a great responsibility. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, it was a, 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 an utter shame for the, for the son of, you know, such rich individuals to, I mean, to go around, like, you know, covered in rags. Right? It was... Like uh, we, this, we don't understand that much. Was about properly the, the deeper commitment of individuals like Francis, Claire, and others. Is that how, let's say, violently radical was the contempt that existed between the the elite and the rest of the people? Because the elite was really overloaded with with an enormous and, and necessary sense of itself. Uh, the poor, the mendicants, but the, the Middle Ages were, you know, medieval communities were full of, right, by default, were just, yes, they, they thought, as the, the Gospel says, that behind er, any of them there could be Christ himself. Um, and they were part of the uh, community landscape, let's put it in this way, uh, sociologically, economically, the... Uh, there was still at this time they would start increasing also to create some problem but it, it's not before the modern age that essentially the beggars the vagabonds etc would be fundamentally taken out quite literally uh, enclosed uh, segregated um, you know from at least the, the most you know developed heirs but still you know a knight thought that he had almost a a quasi-racial superiority over these people, right? Because uh, objectively they were endowed with values and and um, and beliefs that, aside from what mostly ecclesiastical sources historically documented this time in the Middle Ages, right? We we don't know much of uh, as you know from from their lay perspective, but were quite 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 secular, right? They were quite rooted, in fact, in this sense of honor of power. Of, of of sense of oneself of, of moral and physical strength and so on so um the saint francis had seen war had seen fighting had seen what but he you know a normal uh, person of his status would, would get in as a regular ba uh, on a regular basis so um it, it's very important to understand also how deeply humiliating was to sell first of all francis sold the whole his you know what he received from his father, which was also, you know, in economical terms, uh, capitalistically, you have not a few things, right? And he got triggered and angered that, reasonably speaking, because you know, still that was earned, and earned literally in, in, in with you know, in blood and sweat and, and tears. So um, there was um, something like becoming a pariah. In behaving like that and bringing an enormous shame to the name of the house of the family all these things and so uh, it's even again more relevant to think well, the moral forces involved to choose such a lifestyle right and these are things that we find basically in almost every every historical context they're kind of fringe in a way of course most people didn't give a damn as long as they became rich they were content with that and that's then the norm but it is true that there are certain individuals that are, you know, brought to death, right? It may be a progressed inclination, could be a, something acquired, as always, right? Humans are, are a blend of both, but that not just make take these choices, but are, are able to leave such a deep mark, right? In, a, in the case of Francis, in such a coherent sense, after all. So not also going, like at the time, from a secular perspective, it would have been something as we've seen, almost offensive. 
from an ecclesiastical perspective was something else, right? And it was understood such. And so the obedience that these orders, as you will see, as they would form uh, to, to the church and their role in education, their growth, surely their transformation, surely their transformation, something that was very different, in fact, from the original lack of property or, uh, you know, all, all these things, but they, they structured, it became powerful, etc. So some say that's what, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say that, that that was the ruin of those orders, and that things should have gone the other way. That that that, that things cannot go that way, right? In, in a in a normal civilization, or in in any civilization, telling the truth, because there is no such thing like a normal non-normal civilization. Things works always the same way, and so you cannot create a civilization without property. Um, it's it's not a matter of ideology. It's literally f impossible from a physical, scientific point of view. It, it doesn't exist. It's not contemplated in human possibilities. Um, and so, whatever a person does by example is still something that, however, leaves a mark and that shows the moral dimension, uh, uh, the effort and the difficulty. This was seen as a test, right? It was wasn't much just just of, of a lifestyle, but per se it was properly a we have to understand the motivation, the the, re the refusal, say, of still the, the corruption of the world, still of the of the dysfunctionality of it. All of what you can imagine by the 12th, 13th century could go terribly wrong in in somebody's life and in in you know in politics, in in war, and all these things. So uh, you may never know, but this is typical. There were so m many many knights actually from uh, historically that at some point at the end of their career. It's either they they they, they broke down. We, we can't imagine all the post-traumatic stress behind such lifestyle, or probably a sense of repentance, or maybe just fear for for the wrong soul. Uh, in any case, right? You, this maybe are all simplistic altogether, but all you know individually, but altogether they have a meaning that they would become monks themselves and decide to to end their lives like that. So. It would be interesting to, would have been interesting to, to know these people better, uh, more because today in today's times, yes, there are people like this, but it's never quite the same thing, and especially, even in the most, you know, even those areas of the world where you know you would argue lifestyle doesn't seem to be so distant, in, in theory from 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 a medieval one in a way, but not even in this world. Let's say the world was is calibrated in, in the way it was calibrated in 13th century Europe, right? So we can't really tell. We can't really tell historically, and so we can't really tell morally. And also the sources are naturally, uh, you know, have to be interpreted, have to be studied, have to be, uh, you know, understood in their own way. And so Francis had founded a brotherhood a community because they will see also women would participate sisterhoods of lame uh, people who um, starting from his experience as a model intended to live according to spirit of it and without however abandoning their activity and their family mm -hmm. these were known as respectively the second order of the Franciscans, the um, uh, Clarices, right, uh, because of Saint Clair, and the Third Order, known as, in fact, the Tertiaries. And these were fundamental because they they were different degrees, but these were laymen, right? The monks are so. Um, there were some different degrees to which laymen could participate to these uh, orders. Uh, to these clerical orders and 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 they're and still you know I say at their will at their you know sensitivity and need participate to them so living uh, in part kind of a what they would think like a saint lifestyle and in part still however living in the world which was a need that especially in the cities as we have seen was particularly felt because of this new um, um, you know, a mentality acquired towards wealth that posed moral problems that 
was according to some you know if not uh, incompatible with uh, Jesus example still however was to be mitigated with a certain measure so a positive model that wasn't radical but also allowed to you know to everybody fundamentally to 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 experience right a, a, a different uh, a different lifestyle a different spiritual um, you know life properly in fact and to therefore balance this this inner tensions let's say in, in in a way that the church could control could regulate could provide a let's say support for and that for this matter could evolve kind of constructively so at that point the fraternitas founded by francis had become thus a an order also because of its great popularity where lots of people joined which gives you a, a dimension of how many had felt th this need and uh, francis actually would have not liked this perhaps right you know um he you know the, properly the idea of founding an order right there was something about his his ideas that went beyond that it was more totalizing that you know still you know was polemical towards the the world and the temporal power whichever it was however he uh, submitted to the will of the church which is also important it's, it's also important as a form of humility right uh, that unitly other movements had lacked in that sense of you know thinking they could be outside a, a hierarchical um, system of sort thinking they would know better and that nobody has to teach them anything or that they can't they can't do it alone right this is not really an ecclesiastical um, you know principle and the um, uh, the the new order was eventually confirmed by Pope Honorius the third who gave this formal sanction to it and for it Francis um, uh, wrote down in 1221 and in 1223 two mm, different rules uh, two further rules and these were his last meaningful public acts ill and maybe um, you know embittered and uh, he retreated uh, like hermetically leaving some of these disciples to, to the guidance of the, of the order without um, not without however the uh, you know leaving them with the rigorous um, you know indications right instructions to leave always of their own work and according to the rule that um, it, according to him uh, would have had to be followed literally without interpretation susceptible of mitigating its rigor this is this is fundamental Francis had a you know we mostly see that kind of also in the popular culture the kind of the sweet meek side you know the the, the love of nature the creatures but actually you know if you read his his biography he was a, a very stern very strong headed and willed individual right and he had a very clear squared view of how things should be francis died in 1226 he, he would be canonized two years later um now um, the fact you see it's interesting to see especially how his last two rules were written um, such a you know close distance temporal from one another and this is being interpreted in part as a sort of difficulty that that he would have had in order to cope with in order to have the his project accepted by the papacy so this is uh, for the future of his order so we see there there was something like a compromise that had to be done so not really the full you know these rules would have been w were very meditated right it's not that he wouldn't mean them but of course they were thought to essentially preserve part of the the, the uniqueness of his rule of his example his initially you know belief and, and still this um in fact in the framing and uh, you know co congruence with the the church's Mm, you know role and authority uh, 
And so this is remarkable because it is a work of of obedience from one side and liberty from another. So it, it's really what made this happen, the Franciscan order. And, and Francis, we will see it better. Uh, he um, his life and you know what, what you know what we think is told really substantiate itself all but a certain degree is impossible but still we know that there were uh, instances of we'll see now of you know of, of, uh, of radicalism that, that that weren't finished there and that in fact caused splits within the same order and brought even to some new heretical currents because the same Francis thought in many ways was very borderline orthodox right? and so um, this this struggle is fascinating because it was eventually controlled and, and regulated by the Saint Francis but we understand it was a spirit behind that it was much more um, vividly um, you know uncontainable uh, uh, in a sense at least in, in this passion and, uh, and, and vision now um, for in many ways that was a a parallel experience to one of Francis, right? Actually, earlier one, did it? the one of a Spanish clergyman, Domingo of Guzman, right? It was canonic of the Cathedral of Huesca. Now, the Franciscans had took the, their name from, uh, had, excuse me, t taken their name of the of minor friars, right? And this stemmed properly from their humility. So you see here the, still the contrast between the two things. I mean, uh, humility as an example, but also as a and as an attitude, but also as a still a polemical intent, as we've seen towards the hierarchies and so on. So uh, Domingo's followers assumed instead the ones of the preaching friars, because Domingo had remained, uh, uh, let's say, struck by the challenge that heretics had, the, the heretics had brought to the church. Um, he had participated to the, you know, he had been in Occitania, he had uh, talked with Catters, had seen what was happening there, so he was very impressed, and the, the thing was, as we've seen, really a big, a big, big issue. Um, had chosen to contrast, in fact, the heretical work not only with the poor of life, but also with the world, right? This is the main difference between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. The stem, in, indeed, importantly from the life of St. Francis, St. Dominic, um, in different way, this interesting southern European kind of comparison between, you know, communal elite is more, uh, is had more clerical dimension, it, is, it was properly a lay one, whereas um, the, um, you know, the, the initial Dominic's experience was much more still hierarchically framed and focusing also properly on, on the um, first, right, on the educational parts so of that, uh, you know eventually the the franciscans were um organized in a way that would be a copy of the dominican order right as fundamentally the one that you see today right they have their own differences their own institutions but fundamentally they turn into right organization their lifestyle that uh, was basically the same and they both turned into educators right and in top educators even in universities right because there is all a story behind this this is interesting in the fact that uh, somebody had to, given that these were all laymen, they didn't have a great deal of education, somebody had to have that within the order to, to, to make it work, to coordinate. Consider that this experience was so successful that everybody from everywhere joined. So uh, people from, you know, the, the words, people from, from, I don't know, people from England, let's assume, that had never known Francis, but still... Uh, they they do they were developing everything in his li his own lifetime still on their own as their own community so it was something that was escaping of control it was something enormous and so um, you had Dominicans and Franciscans from all over Europe that speak uh, that spoke different languages that uh, in this sense wouldn't understand each other because even those who were kind of e formally educated don't think that just knowing Latin brings even in there to to understand each other there were even funny accidents. Right when you know, especially they came with these, um, you know, rags on, right? As many heretics would actually do, and so sometimes they wouldn't even understand because somebody would, you know, some monk would say, "Are you heretics?" And these people wouldn't understand the local language. 
because they were traveling from other countries and they the only word they knew was kind of yes in the local language so they were immediately imprisoned by local authorities because they, they thought these are erratics they are you know bad people that are come here for, you know who knows with which purpose so there was a need for structure education for organization of course for for property to be administered and so on a hierarchy and and the dominican order is while the, the franciscan one was originally much more focused on this ideal of poverty and property of uh, christ-like imitation this was true in the dominican one but the dominican one took as a bias properly the one of education to counter intellectually the heretics that as we've seen especially in these rich developed cities of, of, of southern france um, and wherever in this in fact in the most urbanized areas of europe had spread were often literate because they were you know people that were were educated that had received in those places the the, the enough uh, literacy enough understanding of the bible to, to even read it autonomously and so to preach it and to, to start that without the permission of the church and thus the dominicans needed uh strongly to prepare culturally very well because their principal function had been consisting in um listening to the confessions preaching and also engaging in public debates still here the oral dimension that occurred often in these crowded cities in the squares etc between i don't know the catters and the dominicans right so dominic obtained also the that the, the the brotherhood his brotherhood became an order in 1215 when he died in 1221 five years before francis the dominicans were at, at that point a great force spread all over europe and thus franciscans and dominicans were called mendicant orders because their poverty was not just personal but it invested also the orders as such they called each other simply fratres, that is, brothers, hence the, the term friars. They did not inhabit monasteries to which they were always tied, like properly the, the monks, but, but in simple convents, right, erected often within the cities, and, and that were only kind of point de right, and so temporary lodgings. And this is the main difference, right, this is between with the monks, right, they properly uh, with, with the friars, so they because these were laymen right it was something different they had some clerical prerogatives but they weren't monks um as such so the um they they often um say organized um you know, their main deal was th this this welfare kind of assistance right this assistance to the poor uh, showing their closeness to them also in livestock right and so uh, organizing such initiatives in a way to demonstrate that um differently from what the heretics were stating you can live in poverty uh, and in sanctity and remaining in perfect orthodoxy as faithful of the church and this is uh this is the the crucial point right so it was it was an enormous slap to all those who were essentially going around stressing that you know ah the church was all wrong it was all corrupted these are just a bunch of bastards we know better how to read the bible because the way we read the bible it's uh, it's the true one the others do not understand anything so you have to listen to us let's tear these bastards down let's do this and that and still yes let's create our own hierarchy and based on dualistic you know nonsense that is not even written in the Bible but, you know um, we know better you know and, and so the uh, look at our lifestyle we are really poor we we, we make we, we fast we all do all this we're so special there are the pures the catters enter our you know society you can become the special the perfect one but right? literally this was ridiculous right and um, the mendicant orders showed dramatically well that poverty was inherent to Catholicism as a model that it could coexist with with orthodoxy uh, with with uh, sanctity and that actually what the others were doing was a sin of pride among the all the other things um, in that uh, the obedience to the church was a fundamental pillar milestone of, of the same 
of the same orthodoxy in itself because there can't be anything different so if you base all of your you know point that uh, you know the church is a satanic hallucination like it, the catters though then you know the proof is that it couldn't be poor then you have a catholic church that showed his divisions of of, of poor and and still yet morally you know intact and and also uh, scientifically educated individuals who started responding their their nonsense and showing the the the, the literally the civilizational capacity of the church well that was great part of the reason why heresies were defeated at this point in history while they seem to be almost be taken over because you know making everything degenerating into a in an anarchy chaotic um you know solvable mess so in other words the mendicant orders provided the church uh that instrument which um the church had I mean, needed in the, primarily in urban society in the 13th century, but at large, right, in European society of the time. Um, the, the orders, the mendicant orders, were not constituted nor by secular clergy that would have had to depend on the respective bishops, nor by monks, as we've seen, so that had a, you know, severe discipline. They were tied to obedience to the abbots. They didn't ha have, you know... Uh, many relations with laymen the mendicant orders depended directly on the holy see instead this it was yet another very important aspect of the story in fact actually the secular clergy didn't like them much because especially the bishops that had always had their natural seat in in the, in the city were the ones that started seeing kind of also undermined part of their of their power right that in part was the same one that had been criticized by the instances of ref of, of, of the reforms and that was criticizing in fact their too old temporal dimension was interfering in any aspect and said mendicants flourished also because many people began at that point to make donations not much to the to the diocese but to these orders Right, and so also shifting an important amount of wealth and kind of allowing the papacy uh, a much greater control, the same bishops through the same order. So, so this direct connection between the papacy and the mendicant was bypassing the uh, traditional secular hierarchy and still, you know, all of a sudden you, you can say after their foundation winning over um, really uh, lots of people so not just those that had traditionally belonged to the to the secular clergy to the bishops the archbishops that were very powerful right but still could have also their own thing to say within the church etc here there was yet another mean for the church to control um, the ecclesiastical hierarchy in spreading further and also making it in in a field that traditionally had not yes as we've seen at the beginning of the video had not been dramatically important but at that point was becoming it was also the education of laymen, right? So not strictly lay education. Oh, let's say because the Franciscans and Dominicans eventually came to the pioneer, even some very important, you know, non-theological fields such as, you know, to, until still which where everything was framed. This also is the great center of scholastics that, in fact, could be pioneered also by the by the same the same orders. So uh, it was an incredible weapon that conferred the church an ever greater power well, on, on Christian. And um, the um, in, in if the Dominicans founded by a, a, a canonist uh, were f more easily open right to and you know accept and let's say of clericalization as we've seen before they had been born already within an ecclesiastical hierarchy that therefore you know tended to make them stay um more away from that lay world which they they still kept working anyhow the same didn't happen for the franciscans in the same way as we were saying before the franciscans were a bit more you know uh fussy and you know a bit more dangerous literally for the church because a part of them instead reacted with violence to the papal impositions that wanted to make them a, a, a cultured and powerful order 
so capable of influencing deeply society and its ruling class right so um a part of the franciscans didn't accept this because they thought it was against uh, france's original ideas so and the rule that as we've seen was being you know was was uh, an import a product of a, of a strife and still was to be taken literally so without too much compromises so were born thus within the franciscanism many um, uh, schism of rigoristic type right so one base probably also the most almost uh, pauperistic and sometimes also hermetic example of Francis but the more moderate wing the so-called conventuals so that accepted also banally the fact that, that the Franciscans had to live within some building right this was literally what the rigorists were stressing like you know who, who, who owned that building who administered that say owned in, in the sense of you know properly of considering you know at least we have to to use it as a and somebody has to organize and so there has to be hierarchy and so this was seen as a so, sort of contamination right but obviously the more moderated wing prevailed fortunately enough and so managed to impose to the order the papal point of view and especially great um say thanks to the great um uh, you know scholar and organizer uh bonaventura Saint Bonaventura from from Bagnoreg. and um, the success that was uh, uh, struck by the the Franciscans and the Dominicans in in the in the 13th century brought to the creation of many orders, right? Um, and in order to control the phenomenon in 1274, the Council of Lyon established, among the other things, um, a recognition only for the Carmelitans and the Augustinians in fact still exist but there were lots of others that at that point said you know literally you're too many right you can't do this yes also the church at point had created we've seen it even with innocent the third some you know kind of special orders in, in a sense but um at this point there was still ruling these movements the problem of even making sense of them because there were too many and especially there were too many people right there weren't just local experiences born like within just a single place and remaining there organizing them. no it, these were sometimes really big things and they brought with them all the the issues that had accompanied the popularistic evangelic movements so they were difficult to regulate as well um and the heretical problem in fact was still kind of alive in a sense because um we've seen this we made a video about the the apostolics and the dulcinians uh, in Italy, this had a specific following, um, and the, especially the Orto Apostolorum, in fact, founded in 1260 by the Parmesan uh, Gerard Segarelli, that has uh, also known as Segarellus in Latin, right? And so, who had entered in collision say, with with the Church after the councilary, um, uh, the council decision um, in 1274, and that was. Um, persecuted and annihilated in fact the same uh, Gerard was uh, burned at the stake on in in the 1300 right and so these movements are very in part they're also very foggy historically also the the Dulcinians were uh, we we don't understand concretely what they were because we understand they were a bit of everything we find armed resistance literally kind of armies and you know still brigandage and you know this this religious instances and people living i don't know in, in isolated places like in the mountains like you couldn't distinguish guerrilla from you know this this movement sometimes and so uh, in part it's also what the church said because at the time everybody you know you know every time it was kind of a some of these problematic movements uh you know if there had been some kind of violence it's often ha happened you know very often there is almost the standard thing in the chronicles in the documents saying you know the you know the, this movements have were armed they had a certain amount of knights etc maybe sometimes they weren't true but the idea that they were subversive and they were basically you know taking matters in their own hands and literally also crushing some secular uh, military forces it was a real thing right so um uh, they're interesting because of all what existed be beyond them 
in terms of social um, you know instances and whatever they, they were requesting at that point that you can argue they didn't even care about by a certain degree I mean what what was the the openness to 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 reconciliation or to properly abandon a certain lifestyle that up to that point was seen by some of its members kind of you know how they should have always lived right there are many parallelisms with modern let's say you know, naturally in very different ways but let's say um, I would say, uh, yes, some movements even think, uh, not banally the hippies, but the idea that they're living in a society without, without hierarchy, with all goods in common, uh, with no distinction between men and women, and no, um, let's say, uh, total freedom, and, and at the end of the day, with this, the generations that turn out into actual violence, and, you know, uh, no constructive civilizational capacity whatsoever well at that point you know there is an extremism that did get violent as we well know also in those same decades and they're complex phenomena because they kind of encompass all society like uh, it's almost political it's factional right it's not that everybody lives like that but you know the, the most radical dimensions take also kind of more negative paths right and also properly the, the idea of, of a lack of any kind of limit um and uh in life and so this is um this is a you know all another thing i hope we will be debating on another level because in another video but because it, it's it's really something that is emerging prepotently historiographically from these things and so um i think it's it's extremely significant to see what the mendicant orders represented at that point as a force of a self-regulating force this is the the interesting aspect of them that they realize that, it, that, 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 that there can be another way of living but still this has nothing to do with tearing down what has already been built uh, as an excuse or uh, as a parent shortcut and at the end of the day is a dramatically dangerous um, delusion that brings to you know to violence to destruction to no active uh, improvement whatsoever or even if these movements kind of alerted the church to, to maintain some certain standards of you know fitness and morality and um etc they um they still you know exceeded with right in, in uh you know if they had had a point that was valid for all society where right, it all it would be a major revolution of this period and still you know uh where did it happen right you can't even argue that this was more less likely at the time because you know in the peasants uh, you know, in, in the countryside, you know, the people could not rebel. This is not really true, right? And this is actually proven by mo moments where the actual depression and, and repression came for real. Uh, and so you understand that there were ways and ways to make things work, and especially these movements happen in areas where, um, let's say, societies were, in a sense, m more, let's say, autonomous by themselves, but were still not... Um, Right, at a big international level, but not really at a local level, where actually a great deal of statal capacities were being built at the time. So it's it's all very fascinating to, to, to study in in perspective. Anyhow, the new heterodox groups um, found at, by that point, however, um, in the Dominicans and the Franciscans, uh, kind of warlike rivals that were deeply prepared to contrast them right do you find this force today towards uh, radical extremism subjectivism moral subjectivism all these things there isn't really right there is maybe yes yeah, traditionally in, in society there is still sent kind of common sense and rationale and you know morality and scientificity but at the same time what, what is fascinating of the time is that is that there are some orders that kind of created themselves in order to put an end to these uh experiments spontaneously the kind of and that accepted the order right in a in a in a, um, in a universal sense right I, as an yeah, inescapable necessity in order to to be righteous according to the same theoretically at least 
standards that those m movements were, were kind of claiming to, to, to embody in a certain sense. So if um, the Inquisition provided an apparatus for the uh, inquiry and persecution of the, you know, of those who were suspected of a heresy, preaching aimed at reconquering the crowds to the church and, and thus subtracting them to the heretical influence. So there were really those who convinced you, who weren't operating simply with the support of uh, secular tribunals, because this was an important deal with regarding also to the juridical prerogatives of the, you know, what kind of, uh, I mean, the church had a jurisdiction, but it couldn't, for example, um, the, the clergy didn't have some, some prerogatives, for example, to sen sentence to death in many instances and so on. So um, this this order, let's say, was the church and secular authorities at the same time, because, of course, some of these movements were really violent and were making a mess. Um, but, like the Dulcinians, it was open warfare, right? And so, um, but the, 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 the medical orders didn't truly have violent um, means, and, 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 and so they were the ones who would say, you know, we'll explain you why this is wrong. So we'll try to convince you. We will show you that this is not the right way. That there is, there is in fact, a scripture where, where all this had started from, right? From the idea that after all these heretical uh, intuitions had started from, from an unregulated, um, unmediated, unsupervised uh, interpretation of the scriptures. And had gone astray. I mean, if you were really to, to evaluate the... I mean, you can argue that no text has ever been interpreted in a univocal way, which is absolutely true. But if you are, say, looking at orthodoxy and, and considering the... I mean, Christian orthodoxy and considering the you know the scriptures, uh, there are ways and ways to interpret certain things. But it, it's very significant that the... Like the... The... Um, the, the, main, the, the situations, let's say, that ended the worst, especially when they were backed by literally, you know, some organized sects or independent churches, were based on wildly... Uh, this is not about uh, heresy, because heresy literally means taking another path in a, in a broader sense, so it can be just metaphorical and even within orthodox in a sense. We all do, in a way, but um, which stresses naturally necessary of a unity of a center. But these were not even practically even Christian religion anymore. Like you, if you pick Catharism as such, well, again, I was saying before that that's not a different interpretation of Christianity. That's simply something else, right? It's literally another religion. It's a dualistic religion, as many that had existed, of which you can argue also Christianity had been influenced historically and culturally. But it's normal. Um, but that had nothing to do with what the the Bible says, or at least, you know, even if it was, of course, based on the Bible, it was, like, wildly, you know, you know, opposed to, to, to even to, to the most elementary notions that are provided with by the, in, in, in the Gospels, right? So you have to make an extra, you have to bridge some gaps that are, there's no literal ev evidence for scriptural evidence that point in order to, to to see things in that way it's just a form of you know moral narcissism to pretend that that's just your own interpretation is the absolute one for which you you, you have to make you know to take even up arms against and to kill papal legates to start doing things that are really you know uh, at that point way beyond theology so that's quite a big deal and initially, it was the Dominican order to perform better this role of persuader because, um, as we've seen, it had this greater educational bias. And so uh, uh, the Dominicans originally were the most cultivated, right? The most, the most cultured, most educated friars. Um, and, and for this reason, it was called opera predicatorum, right? And so for the... 13th century, we actually don't have direct sources about, for example, the, the preaching of the new orders, right? Especially the one in, in vernacular that was dedicated to a, to a public, to an audience of laymen. 
So again, this is very important for the the actual records because that was all that is all gone, right? Most people were were just listening to to them; they weren't reading what they what they wrote at large. So that's where the main battle was fought, and um, we still lack those recordings. So the collections of the sermons in Latin that were aimed at the clergy, but let's say that seemed to have been used also as a as a sketch for the preachings in, in vernacular show however deep um say sen sensible remarkable changes compared to the past because even in these sectors universities offered uh, an important contribution to the cultural renewal they uh, modernized the um homilies production both uh, at a stylistical and continuistic level the manuals known as the artes predicandi so properly how to you know the arts of preaching uh, taught the friars how to compose um, um, uh, a speech capable of interesting um, a new audience the city one that felt up to that point kind of um, outdated the, the the instruments and words elaborated in the traditional monastic environment so um, it thus made its appearance the so called sermo modernus so uh, so the modern word the modern sermon that was obtained by uh, ap applying the precepts of dialectic and the new religious contents that were elaborated within the um, universities by scholastic theology that we also have to talk about at some point because I think we never made a, a video on, on scholastics per se which is kind of weird given all the ones in the history of the church we already made um, and this is also um, remarkable because you understand the Dominican orders became themselves university teachers meaning that they acquired uh, uh, at the end of uh, 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 an enormous cultural uh, capacity that was literally done by educating the the bad they were, they were simply properly a part of the uh, a quote of of of, uh, of friars that had to be sent in the best universities in europe to learn theology Mostly in Paris. Paris, we know that it was very started being very crowded, uh, even more crowded than before, at least uh, when the Manican orders were created, because they needed that, and and they started thus becoming as educated as the others, as the top uh, intelligentsia at the time, and so this um, brought to a uh, to the the, the Manican orders being literally very modest. I mean, culturally modest individuals to uh, to dominate, literally uh, teaching at, at at all level, right? At a moral, scientific level, in in low medieval Europe, and pioneering the, the greatest change, and also in 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 um, in fact in in, in um, educational model and teaching practice. That is at the same base of scholastic that brings in essentially a scientific rational dimension that is even more relevant when you consider that this had been, especially in the case of the Franciscans or the, the populistic evangelic orders in general, the the one of a more kind of mystical, ascetic experience that was kind of different from from this gnosiological one is kind of. Um, in fact, properly scientific and rational one that was the integration of Aristotle's um, philosophy in in the in the Christian teaching, whereas before all the also movements of the Reform, etc., had been influenced by Platonism, as as always, but it had been since since Augustine, and uh, as such, they they had perhaps missed this kind of more technical scientific dimension in order to properly show to pr to prove 
to prove wrong whatever the most subjective you know opinion could be on issues that were uh, naturally eventually you know it would be criticized when you know to the same scholastic in the way they were explained but let's say that up to that point had never existed this is yet another thing we forget all the time these things had never been done before right so in a way you couldn't even predict how, how they would end and yet they succeeded clamorously in their goal I mean but secondly also they brought on the fore a you know more sensible rational approach to reality that um, that I would say is the base of any orthodoxy and and any civilization at the core, right? You can't have anything standing on its feet on radical subjectivism uh, and uh, and moral relativism uh, as a you know as a consequence. Like it's impossible, and uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen even today. So the, uh, the this passed through the work in 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 the world, by the way, which the clergy at that point had never quite done, at least in the in the exemplary way, right, in part because of the necessities of temporal uh, affairs that required bishops to literally take matters in their own hands as, as governors, as uh, military commanders, and so, you know, why should they, they have renounced uh, in line of principle to, you know, even being kind of equal to the others in practice. But, um, um, as a consequence, um, the um, the, uh, the also the, uh, the 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 monks that had uh, uh, secluded themselves and they had, albeit remaining in contact with the world, still, however, being referentially connected to their own rule, to their own monasteries to their own discipline and n not attempting a, a more comprehensive uh, say re literally re um, reorganization of the of the uh, educational standards for the new times for the new political and social forces were emerging at the time so the 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 relevance of the mendicant orders is immense in this landscape and it brings to the to the quite um, humbling uh, realization that um, there is a, a path, right? You know, you see in here from the beginning to the end that has eventually trans necessarily transformed the same, the same mendicant orders, but still for a purpose that was successful. So this, in my opinion, teaches us that civilization cannot but operate along certain patterns. That it have to be fi found out at every time that can also come from the to the most humble to the most common people not really from those who are the best in a progress way because of course the system can be faulty in a way or another but let's say it's about mostly the energies the forces the examples M many of these you know friars of course never left a mark we don't even know how what they were named and so on but let's say the 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 example that was provided by them with with a lifestyle that at that time was courageous was radical, was different, but it was still siding with with order and the hierarchy, and so playing together and you know to to, to the same positive goal. Actually, in, in my opinion, is very 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 um, comforting. It, it's very uh, positive. It, it, it's one of the greatest accomplishments of uh, of the church, in, you know, historically and and specifically in that context. That was really bringing Christendom on the on the brink of of, of a hopelessly, um, you know, uh, you know, a hopeless uh, fragmentation, right? And and so uh, something that could could might have generated much more disorder than what we we would even imagine, and at the point that even the Reformation was something, you know. Surely epochal and breaking and terrifying f for those times and, and and everything, but still, you know, it could have d at least took somewhat an orderly path because you know, so m major countries were involved in that, so they they kind of regulated the thing within. So there was a completely different um, degree of coercive means of centralization. By the 13th century, by the 12th century, 
this thing could have easily been generating something much worse in perspective, right? And it did not. And so this huge effort um, is being largely forgotten, neglected. Um, I d I'm not entirely sure it's it's um, it's adequately stressed in the uh, you know in in the common person's view of history of uh, scholastic education or anything like. You, do you know that these things happened? in the first place, and why they happened, and what, what would have been like if they hadn't happened. That's yet another question that you can never ex fully ex you know, answer, but it's worth reflecting on. So for now, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.